Hi there, I'm James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, and I am starting my October 6, 2019, episode 12 podcast. And today I will be discussing uh, dominant leash control, the psychology of buying the perfect leash, controlling strangers approaching your dog, uh, your dysfunctional dog, no matter how cute your dog is, uh, how to deal with that when people do come on uh, to you and say, hey, I want to touch your dog, I want to touch your dog. And if your dog is somewhat reactive, dysfunctional, this is what we're going to do to address it. So I, I did get time today to be able to write out some notes before I, uh, I post it. So this way at least it gives me a little bit of an ability to track what's going on. Uh, later on, after I finish this, I, uh, hi Brandy. Uh, later on, after I finish this, I'm going to go to Peace Love Danes and do a live uh, vlog um, response to uh, Aaron... Uh, I think Aaron's... Okay. Hi, Lori. I'm going to go on to uh, your group tonight um, to do a live vlog for um, Aaron. And um, she had sent me the message as well in regards to her dog, Cyrus. And um, that's the one who, um, who's who been playing with the toys and so forth like that. And, um, you know, pulled out the stuffing, etc. And then he, he nipped her. And why is that? And it's a bit of a complicated one. So this one's nice. I like it. It's a little bit of a, of a little bit of a challenge in the sense of, well, you know, how do I explain it to the human beings? We'll see the reason evident, but uh, otherwise that's the case. Um, please share my video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm doing this all pro bono. I'm doing this all for free, obviously to educate people. Uh, there's no ads on my website. There's no, you don't see any advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what I'm asking is if we can just, thank you, Lori. So awesome, and same with John Pollock too, as well, and and Stephanie Campbell, uh, some of the great people uh, in 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 rescue, and all that stuff is great. Hi, Brandy. Um, so if you could share it, if you could subscribe to my channel, my Twitter, and so forth, the more people that do get to know who I am, the more it does pick up, and it is happening and it is working slowly, 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 trying to fight the tide of all the uh, um, entrenched trainers and behaviors. You're welcome. Lori, uh, trying to help all the um, trainers and behaviors that are actually interested in saving our dogs' lives and not padding their bank accounts and all that stuff. And um, you know, so I hope that uh, we can get this spread out here. So I will start off this because I, I want to have some time so I can go over to Peace Love Danes and um, uh, do a bit of a vlog. Hopefully, Erin will be online. I, I did message her uh, back, and uh, I know that she is probably just super busy. So I put in um, some live broadcast pre-notes here. And I'm going to go over it. So um, the first one is uh, that I just said in regards to dominant leash control, the psychology of buying the perfect leash and controlling strangers that want to approach your cute but dysfunctional dog. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the psychology of buying the perfect leash. I had a group session yesterday and, you know, people have different types of leashes. Some people have retractable leashes. Some people have a forefoot lead. Some people have a, a bungee cord style lead and all these other different types of leashes and and you know you want to get the leash that's going to make you feel confident and buy the leash that you want to have right whichever kind of leash you want that you feel comfortable with but you want to train and you, and preferably you want to use a standard six foot leash six feet standard doesn't have to be fancy schmancy you want it weight appropriate I've seen a lot of people who have 20, 30, 40 pound dogs and they have a leash that's set for a Great Dane. And, and of course, the weight of the leash itself is probably six ounces, eight ounces. And you can imagine that weight that's sla uh, slamming and swinging against your 20, 30, 40 pound dog's body all the time as they're feeling it. It's the same thing if somebody wears a lot of jewelry constantly and you're just like, how do you even handle all that noise and the feeling and all that? And because the dogs are highly uh, receptive to touch, you can imagine how that's somewhat irritating. And I use that part of uh, how how I know dogs are super sensitive to touch because as, as anybody has seen is if you touch the dog that is somewhat skittish or you touch the dog by their wound, if they have an injury, they're going to be reactive right away. Uh, one of the stories that I have said to people is uh, when Walter first came here, and Walter's the, the Great Dane, 180 plus pounds, who attacked 16 people in New York, dragged the shelter work into his kennel, uh, bit a bit, bit someone in the face who got close to his kennel, and that person, that child, actually needed uh, plastic surgery, uh, partially blind and deaf from being beaten so badly about the head, and extremely male prejudice, of course, and you know, 
of course, uh, is this significant uh, abuse brought on by the hands of uh, ignorant, low educated people. Um, so what would happen is uh, the house that I was renting was an old house at the time. It's an old rancher style house and the, the hallways weren't that big. And uh, I had to trigger Walter just to let him know sensitivity wise that I wasn't going to hurt him, etc. And he was very hyper vigilant about being touched or approached in any way whatsoever. And this is again was uh, in the beginning. If I was just looking at Walter, he would immediately lunge to attack me because of course he had vision impairment so he couldn't make out what I was doing look like I was confronting him in a way or about to injure him so then he would lunge at me feet at a time uh, coming after me and I would have to um, somewhat hide and run away or get something to shield me so those are some pretty scary times one time what I would always do is uh, I'd be in the hallway this is when I, there's enough trust that I could be in the same hallway with him without him going after me uh, or, or you know and he knew all the places that I could possibly hide in the house so um, some really difficult times but when we got comfortable enough to that trust point which is a huge point for for Walter you know of course as a human being I'm always afraid any human being with a dangerous dog is afraid of being attacked especially if the dog is walking beside you especially if the dog and I'm five foot eleven if he's up to my chest the top of his head and when he's standing height he is uh, over six feet four inches standing height. So when he would walk by, uh, by me and he's, his body from bum, not tail, but bum to tip of his nose was five and a half feet long. So when he would go by me, I would reach out purposely and touch him on the back, just on the top, on the, on the tail. Just, I would just tip him like that. And he would immediately turn around and get my hand. And the thing was, I already knew that when I went to touch him, I was pulling my hand back already. He would turn around and be able to swing around in that hallway precisely knowing velocity targeting as I said the other day and grab my hand and and either bite it hold on to it or nip it and warn me so we went through those processes of our relationship of our friendship um, as we got more and more trust but again the dog is so sensitive they know exactly where they're being touched and they're able to process at one tenth of a second their environment their field of vision that they're able to target exactly where my hand is it's just brilliant the the predatory nature of dogs so um, we want the psychology of buying the perfect leash. So not just for, for us, but for also for our dog. So that we're not having this heavy weight that's going back and forth and, and always constantly irritating your dog as they're walking. And especially, and, and again, everything I talk about in all my vlogs are about dysfunctional dogs. Reactive dogs, dangerous dogs, extremely dangerous predatory dogs. I'm not talking about your, you know, and, and I don't mean to devalue this when I say, you know, your regular aggressive dogs or your bite level four, bite level five, bite level six dogs. Those are just regular dogs um, in the sense of my scale. Uh, and, and we address those things. I'll, I'll talk about those things, especially with this leash aspect of it. But when it comes to everything that I talk about, the scale is at my nine or ten in that sense of it. So it's not just me trying to be ignorant to people or trainers and behaviors. I'm just trying to bring that point of have an understanding of scale because when you talk about bite four, bite five, bite six level dogs, they all blend into some huge pot of being killed for behavioral euthanasia. So anyhow, okay, so the psychology of buying them a perfect leash is again, helping your dog be able to understand that there's a certain weight to that leash. And again, you want that weight appropriate the strength of that, the tensile strength of that leash appropriate for the weight of your dog. So if you have a 50 pound dog, you want to get a leash that is rated to 50 pounds, maybe to 75 pounds. And then that's it. Because if you have a leash that's too thick or too thin, that doesn't feel appropriate for the weight, consciously, while the leash is in your hand, you're going to be thinking about it like, oh my gosh. And if the leash is too thin, you're going to be thinking to yourself, I have to try harder because I don't have enough to grip on. If your leash is too heavy, you're going to be holding on to it too tight subconsciously because it's like, it's a big heavy leash, I better be ready. So all these things that happen on the psychology. Buy a six foot leash, again, like I said, as a standard, you can have any other kind of leashes that you want. I use retractable leashes and I'll get into that later on. And I know everybody says, don't use a retractable leash, etc. But in the hands of an experienced user, someone who's proficient and paying 99.9% .9 of the attention on your dog and the leash, having a retractable leash is actually an amazing uh, tool to have. So I want to just uh, go on that part. So again, when you do go look for your six foot leash at the pet store, just go to the bargain uh, shelf, 
go to the bargain bin basement. A lot of times those pet stores will discount their leashes uh, that are perfectly excellent leashes, but because the color has changed for the next season. So you can pay uh, five bucks for a $20 leash and it works exactly the same. So the reason why, um, okay, sorry. Uh, so always have a standard six foot leash, right? So again, that six foot leash, the reason why I say standard six foot leash is because most people use a six foot leash. I would say probably 80% of the people out there that have dogs are using a six foot standard leash. So we wanna use that and I'll get into that part uh, later on, which I actually forgot to mention here, why in my notes, but uh, I'll get to that part of the standard six foot leash. So every six foot leash has a loop, right? Oh, you know what? I should have grabbed myself a leash. Let me, let me, I'll be right back. All right. Okay. So you got the standard six foot leash, right? So you got your clip, which is just clip and then you have your loop this is your loop right standard six foot loop you, if you have small hands then you might want to have someone stitch it through a little bit tighter so that that's good on you hi uh, William yes William William's there he thinks we're going for a walk I know um, okay so when you have the leash this is where you want to put it and, and here's the thing people say don't have a don't you know don't put the leash around your your wrist because if your dog runs they're going to pull you and they're going to pull you off your feet and you get injured and, and you're going to get hurt, which is true. And it's happened to me. And, uh, you know, any of us Dane owners, Mastiff owners, uh, strong dog owners, once you <laughs> once you fall off your feet and uh, our dog starts pulling us, it's not a fun ride. And we get dragged for, for feet and sometimes longer than that. Someone actually told me, uh, actually, I think it was um, um, uh, Mike and, um, and Colleen the other day that one of their friends who has a Mastiff, uh, she wasn't holding on to her leash properly, but she, she somehow got tangled in her hand and her, her dog, I think again, was a massive and ran off and she woke up like an hour, two hours later, uh, on the ground. Uh, so I guess he took her for a ride and then she banged her head. So it can be quite dangerous. Um, so the reason why we get, we, we fall, the reason why we, we get hurt is because we're not paying attention. And so when people say, you know, don't put the loop around your wrist because you could get hurt. Well, it's because we're not paying attention. It's the same thing as if we're driving our car and we see someone in front of us who's going to run a red light. And we can see them about to go through the red light and we know that and we just keep going in our green, you know, on our green thing. Well, it'll be their fault when I get an insurance claim. But the reality is if you're being cautious, you're paying attention and you'll be braking, and you'll be slowing down to avoid the accident. Same thing with the loop. If you're paying attention to what's going on, and like I said, I've been dragged, I've been fall, <laughs> I've fallen, and I've been hurt, and I'm I'm getting angry at my dogs. In actual fact, it's not their fault because I wasn't paying attention. And sometimes I'll have two dogs, and like I say, is a 150 pound uh, Great Dane dig in power, momentum dig in power, can generate two to three times their body weight. So we're talking 450 pounds and more, depending on the the velocity and the intensity of their movement. And I've had two Danes. Um, and I've gone for a little bit of a, a couple of a couple of quick steps with them, um, but again, there's no use getting angry at either one of them. It wasn't their fault because I know they're going to do it. I know my dog's behavior, even if it's somebody else's dog that I'm rehabilitating. You know, when they when they pay uh, for a spot here, it's still my fault. It doesn't matter how bad their dog is and how their dog keeps pulling on the leash. It's still my fault. I'm the handler. I'm in control of the car. I'm in control of the leash. So that's what happens. So if it does happen, they pull off, then you know whose fault it is. It's our fault. And there's, again, don't get angry at your dog. It's not your dog's fault. Wow, Rita, that's awesome. You must have this amazing road rash down the beach. I haven't seen your, I haven't seen your video on YouTube. <laughs> so that would be funny. Uh, I'm sorry. But yeah, I know what you mean, Rita. Okay, so... When you have the leash here, and uh, sorry, I, I gotta just clear up this uh, thing because of the comments, I can't see anything, unfortunately. Um, okay, so we want the leash this way, around our wrist, and through our palms. Okay, so I'll try to show it through our palms. This is where we want it, through our palms. And anybody that's worked with me knows this is what I always say to do, through our palms. And take a leash yourself and figure it out and feel it. You see this feeling? Sorry, I just got to turn this off here. Uh, there we go. Okay. So 
take the leash and hold it this way at all times. Now what happens is we have opposing thumbs. So here's the thing is when we're holding the leash and we're always nervous about it, it's because we're not paying attention to our leash and we're consciously thinking about our leash and consciously thinking about holding it. And why? Because at the end of our leash is our dog and we're always concerned that our dog is going to pull us. So when we keep the leash like this, we don't have to consciously think about it. And the reason why, and, and again, at home, go grab your own leash and everything like that. Put it around your wrist, through the inside of your palm, and you see your see my thumb, right? If it's like that, it pulls out, right? Thumb is open, natural anchor. This is your. That's how easy it is. And if you want to use your ninja skills, which is what I always use for ninja skills, close your fingers. A light amount of pressure so that you feel tension at the back end. A light amount of pressure. And have a friend do this with you, right? Keep your palm open and have them pull. You'll feel them pulling your arm and it, it won't come out, right? But if it's closed, it comes out, right? So it doesn't come out when you close your palm and your fingers on it. And you, again, just loosely, a little bit of a touch. Have someone pull on it and you'll find when you do that, your fingers will automatically fist become a fist. And then when that fist happens, the rest of your arm... And your shoulder becomes tense, it becomes locked up. It's the same thing as an evolution falling through, you know, through primate aspect of our evolution. It's falling through the trees, grabbing onto the branches as we fall. You see that? Closing it, the whole arm goes. And so if we're not thinking about it anymore, if we're not thinking about holding onto the leash, because now subconsciously we just have to go like this. Squeeze, that's it. See that? That's all we have to do. The leash post, we squeeze. We don't have to do anything else. Then we are no longer consciously thinking about our leash control. And our confidence starts to build up by this part. And you'll see that. And then what ends up happening is you're no longer thinking about it. And you get to concentrate on other things. And because of this part, because if the, if the dog pulls, look how much you don't, have, you don't have to do anything. You just squeeze. That's it. And it's tight. Practice it with your friends, uh, with your husband, your your uh, wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, and you'll see that the whole tension picks it up, and you feel really powerful on it. And if you're walking, just squeeze every once in a while and feel that tension. That's all you have to do. For people with OCD, it's a great thing to do as well because you, know, you can just squeeze it all the time, and you know where it is, and you keep practicing, practicing, and practicing. So the next part about that... Um, Okay, let's just see. Holding the loop properly, right? Okay, we did that. Impossible for any dog. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to go on the other part. Oh, actually, yeah, okay. So, uh, impossible for any dog to dominate their owner or leash. So, how many times have you heard these uh, these uh, uh, inexperienced people who go and say, Hey, you know what? Your dog should walk beside you on your left or on your right. Your dog should walk behind you or your dog can't walk in front of you or your dog can walk in front of you, but they can't, you know... I keep him on a two-foot leash and all stuff. So here's a here's the thing. If your dog is just part of your family, you're you're not training your dog to be a trick, you know, tricks or obedience, or um, uh, uh, search and rescue or agility or anything at all. It doesn't matter where your dog walks. There's no dominant control concern about it. Doesn't, your dog is not dominating you on the leash. If you don't care where your dog walks and he's just a regular dog, not a specialty training show off to my neighbors that my dog can, you know, flip upside down and run up walls, it doesn't matter. You let your dog walk whichever way you want them to walk on the leash. It doesn't matter. And then they say, well, you know what? My dog, I want my dog to know that I'm in control, which is the alpha aspect of humanity, which is our insecurity of not being able to trust another life. Uh, to trust our dog to pay attention to us because we don't have respect from them so then of course we're like i need to dominate my dog and my alpha and all that stuff which is just ridiculously uh silly and that again all that information comes from the dog training industry the dog psychology the dog academics uh the academia the the the, the animal behaviors and all that stuff because Here's the thing is, there's absolutely no way your dog can dominate you on leash. Because of what? Because of this. They have six feet at all times. So your dog goes up to the end of the six feet 
right? They're right at the end, of, and they're at the end of the six foot lead. Is your dog dominating you? How do you correct your dog from that when he's at the end of the six foot lead? You go like this. You pull him back in. Dog's not dominating you anymore. The dog, your dog, only has six feet to dominate you in, if you allow him to be. No dominant leash control. So I just debunked that as well. Because if you know what you're doing with your leash, and if you're paying attention with just this loop, you're in control. So you don't have to go pay some trainer or behaviors $150, $200, $300 to learn how to control your dog on leash. That's it. And the next few lines I'm going to talk about, I'm going to save you three, four, five hundred dollars $500 on how to properly walk with your dog on leash and why and how to have people approach your dog, etc. Like I said, I'm doing this uh, pro bono. I could have soaked everybody for this and have some special training programs, but why? Why would I subject people's dogs to suffer further at the cost of money for me? So I'm just trying to change the world, and I'm a bit passionate about it, as you can tell. Uh, and again, my scale goes from the fact that I have worked with the dogs at the at my uh, V10 level, which are predatorial, have attacked at least 12 human beings uh, with intent to kill people, including myself. And um, from that scale, I, I have learned really so much more that it's important to, to share my rare gift with people as opposed to try to profit off of the death of dogs. All right. So again, your dog has, uh, Anthony, uh, William, stop. Your dog has no dominant control on you on leash. As long as you're holding it, as long as you got it here, absolutely zero way that your dog can dominate. And yeah, oh yeah, you know, your dog's running off and then starts yanking you at that time. If you're paying attention to your dog, your dog is not going to yank you. Because as you see your dog starting to run out, you're going to be prepped to hold on to the lead so that they don't pull you. And if you need to, you take your second hand and you hold it here. You don't hold it here because that's subconsciously our attempt to fail control of our leash responsibilities, right? It fail, our failure on purpose. But if we hold it here, then we feel it trunked. We feel it firm altogether. And how many times have you tried to pull somebody on a tug of war? If you held it like that, it doesn't work. And you do that, right? Natural. So again, we're eliminating the conscious efforts. We're concentrating on the subconscious efforts. So that way you don't have to consciously think about controlling your dog's leash anymore. Your dog gets up to the six foot lead and they're pulling and they're pulling and they're pulling on the lead and they're straining, especially with skittish dogs and they're pulling on the lead. And the people who've worked with me, all you have to do is this. Don't yank your dog off their feet. Don't tug a war with your dog. When your dog's straining, like that. You see the looseness? And then what will happen is your dog will go out again. And you pull it back again. And that's how you do it. And you keep doing it. And within uh, three to five little tugs, as you guys play tug of war, just enough to pull them back to remind them, hey, stop pulling. And then your dog will eventually go to the end of their lead without pulling. And uh, anybody that's worked with me, 100% of you will all be able to attest that that worked every single time. Simple technique. That's how you regain dominant control of your leash without making your dog feel like as if he's inferior to you. Um, and, and so what that is, is a, it is a, a passive control, right? Like I said, passive training, passive control, which reduces your, the owner's conscious efforts of controlling uh, William. Uh, which is the uh, reduces our conscious need to control our leash. Our conscious need is reduced from having to control our dog at the end of that leash because subconsciously, we're like, yeah, go ahead, run to the end. The other thing that I tell people to do is, well, okay, William, stop, please. The other thing that I tell people to do is if you are nervous about your leash, instead of what everyone seems to do all the time, they spaghetti it because they're not sure. And notice how when you spaghetti it and when people spaghetti it, you feel it even tighter because, okay, now I have a a really good grip on my leash. Insecurity. That's what it is. We as the handler, as our dog's owner, as our dog's parent, insecure. So we need to make sure that we feel that we're secure. So we we, we just do too much then that we don't have to. So you leave it this way. You hit, keep it this way. Right? The second step. And if you want to feel like it's if you're in control, you use your other hand, your left hand. If you're right-handed, you use your left hand, your opposite hand. Underhanded, not overhanded, 
because if you're overhanded, then it causes you to feel strain, right? You're not casual anymore. When you keep it open-handed, you close it like that, and you still have it. And you find, like a fisher person, you find that you have more control, and it's much more of a casual feeling. So that when you do have to pull, you can pull them both together. And the beautiful part is, because the dog only sees the end of the leash. Logic-driven processing of that. It's a psychological aspect. I don't have time to go into that because we're just dealing on the rudimentary stuff today. But at the end of the day, your dog sees the end of the leash, this. Your hand over here doesn't mean anything to them as per se. So when you pull back at two, three, four feet on the length, your dog doesn't know what's going on. Your dog thinks you're correcting him all at once. You know, like, oh, sorry, my thing's going off here. Uh, your dog is, correcting, is being corrected at three or four feet for you, three or four feet, your dog still thinks he's at six feet, at the six foot lead, because he sees the end of the lead. He doesn't know your hand is here doing the actual physics, the actual pulling of it. And so that way when your dog runs out, and, you're, and as you feel the lead and your dog runs out, you just close your hand and you pull him back. A little tug. Never pull your dog off their feet. Never pull your dog up off the ground. Tug of war. And if you're trying to stand on one foot yourself, you can imagine how uncomfortable that is for a dog to be on just two feet makes them even more riled up. And if you see the dogs playing or fighting, they jump up on their hind feet to get an advantage to be much more focused, much more predatorial in their aspects of going for their target. Um, okay, so we do that. Oh, you know one of the things too I saw? Um, uh, someone talking about... Um, Oh my gosh, this is so dumb. Uh, with regards to, uh, they had a dog, and this is just, this is a few times I've read this uh, in different posts and all that stuff. They've got their dog, and what ended up happening was, they were told, <laughs> they were told, because their dog's reactive or not paying attention or whatever, and they were told to take a leash connected to their dog and then tie it to their belt. And don't say anything to their dog and just walk around all day and dragging the dog here and dragging the dog there and dragging the dog everywhere. And they're like, oh, and it works so well. It works so well. My dog is now compliant and everything like that. All you did was you alphaed your dog without talking to them. You alphaed that dog without letting your dog, your dog, know you're having any communication with them. If I did that with any of the predators that come in through my place here, the, the pit bulls, right? You know, the over, or the, uh, the, the much, uh, much misaligned pit bulls. Uh, if I did that to them, none of that would ever work here. Everything that I talk about has worked from the V10, the dogs that are predatorial, downward. I didn't go from the bottom and start trying to find my way up and grasp it. I started at the top and I, and I was forced into it. So everything that works at the V10 level, at the dogs that attacked at least 12 people, at the dogs that have predatorial intent to stalk, trap, and kill human beings, I worked with those dogs all the way down to the mildest dogs that have OCD and spin around in circles and so forth like that. When you attach your dog to your body and you're walking around all over the place and you're not talking to your dog, your dog becomes property your dog becomes devalued. There's no relationship between you and your dog. Your dog becomes compliant and submissive in the sense of not having their own individuality. And then they're always waiting and waiting and waiting to see what you're going to say and what you're going to do next. Your dog has no individuality because you don't have respect for that. If you were to hang out with somebody all day and they didn't say anything to you and they just followed you everywhere, you went to the shopping mall, you went to the grocery store, what do you think that person is going to make you feel like, holy cow, this person is just whatever. It's just driving me nuts. The shadow of my stalker. Imagine following somebody else all day and you don't say anything to them. And you just follow them all day long. And as you're following them all day long to the mall, to, to shopping, to the laundromat, whatever it is, and they don't talk to you at all. How do you feel? You're devalued as a person, as a being ever go for a car ride and you're the passenger or you or the driver doesn't matter and the person with you in the car ride you know five hour car ride doesn't say anything to you at all you're just like this is the worst car ride ever unless of course you don't like talking to each other and then that's a different story so just remember again and the reason why <laughs> the people talk about the guys uh, the girls uh, the trainers who talk about putting it on the thing those are alpha trainers 
And those alpha trainers, they got to a certain point. They thought they knew what they were doing and they got rever revered by all the people saying, oh my gosh, it's such a brilliant idea. And they just kept up on it. They kept alphaing, alphaing it and they kept being alpha in regards to that whole approach, which is again, another tacit aspect and it's another breakdown in the understanding of dog psychology. It's, it's, it's dumb. It's dumb and it's completely useless. And it's just, it's disgusting because all those trainers do is they devalue the dog's value as a life. And then that dog doesn't develop emotionally or cognitively because the dog is always, well, this is the only rule I know is to follow my human right from day one. Sorry, I, I, like I say, is this uh, too much dumb things? Um, okay, so I talked about dominant leash control. The less you have to think, uh, the more you're in control. Again, if you're not consciously thinking about controlling the leash, subconscious, one less thing to think about. Because all you have to worry about is if your dog bolts off on you, you squeeze your hand. You use two hands to hold on. The other part people say is, oh yeah, but my dog is too tough and, they, and they're always yanking on me and they're always pulling on me. You hold on. You hold on and you hold on. And um, okay, so uh, let me just see here. Uh, when transferring leash control. Okay, so whenever you hand the leash over to, to your partner, to somebody you're walking with, you're gonna, the other person is going to take the leash. They're going to look at your dog. So you're gonna look, they're going to look at the dog and they're going to say their dog's name. You just have to wave it. You don't have to bend down to their head and, and like, you know, just even just while you're standing straight up, you just kind of hold it to the side so that they can see peripherally. And you just say the dog's name, Bill, and that's it. You don't have to try, Bill. And then your dog, you'll see, your dog will like, oh, okay, I see it. And that's it. And then your dog knows who has the end of the leash. Remember I talked about the dog understands logically the end of the leash. <laughs> the dog sees another person in control. Then your dog's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And so the analogy is, again, is if you're a passenger in the vehicle, right? I have to use all these human analogies because when I used to explain it in more of a psychological aspect, people were like, huh? So if you're a passenger in the car and you've got this great driver and you're on a long road trip, and you fall asleep. And then you wake up and there's this other driver that's driving. You didn't realize that some other person has started driving and then you look over to see who it is and it's this person that you know is a horrible driver. You're like, uh, if I knew you were gonna tra trade drivers, I would have stayed awake five extra hours so this person didn't have to drive instead. When you transfer leash control, your dog needs to know who is taking them in control. That's why you acknowledge it by saying, Bill, and that's it. Then your dog goes, registered it. The other aspect is, um, whoever has a leash is in control. Reason why whoever has a leash who is in control? So that in the beginning of training, your dog knows that the person who has your leash, who has their leash, is a person who's going to be consistent with them with all their commands, which means that if you need to correct your dog while you're holding the leash, you don't let anyone else correct them. You don't let anyone else, uh, like part of your family, you don't let anyone else go and pet them and go, good boy, and congratulate them, and give them affection or praise. If you're in control of the leash, only you do the praise, only you do the correction. This teaches your dog that one, whoever has a leash is taking care of me, and that two, that you're making sure that the consistency of your, your command and your control with your dog is just with you. It's just with the person on leash. Um, okay, so let's just see here. All right, when strangers want to pet your cute but dysfunctional dog, how many times have you got your dog, you know, skittish or reactive dog? Well, I'm gonna say skittish because they're less likely to, to bite people. And again, if you have a dysfunctional dog, if you have a dog that's reactive, that is potentially even that little bit where you're not confident that may bite somebody or bite someone's dog, do not take the risk. So this is my warning, my disclaimer, my caveat, do not take the risk. But if you're comfortable enough and you're in control of your dog and they're meeting somebody, a stranger or whatever, and I say stranger, it's better. Um, you wanna be able to control your dog. So when you have a stranger that comes up to you and says, oh my gosh, your dog is so cute, because you know, let's face it, pretty well every single dog in the world is all is very cute. And then they see the dysfunctional dog because a dysfunctional dog seems a little bit more sadder and a little bit more on alert or well-eyed and they seem a little bit different. So a lot of times people are like, 
Oh, that dog looks sad. I want to make that dog feel good. It's human nature, right? We want to take care of people. We want to do that. You have to establish... Oh, oh, be, oh, actually, that's what I forgot. I forgot to write that down, transferring leash control as I was going up the page. So sorry to bounce back here. Um, the, another reason why you want to be consistent on the leash and not let anybody else touch your dog or, pet, uh, you know, con, you know, uh, uh, um, praise your dog or, or, or correct your dog, just you with the leash, so that they know consistently that you, the one who has a leash, that whoever has a leash is taking care of your dog and protecting them. What that also teaches your dog is in the event they ever get lost, they get spooked and they run away and they're lost and people will start calling for your dog. When your dog sees a leash, they will automatically know the consistency of control, of care, of safety. We teach our dog passively again in another way that this leash, whenever they see it, if they're lost, that they'll go, oh, okay, oh, leash, yay. That's what you want to do. Um, again, everything that I talk about is a multifaceted, multi-level aspect of uh, psychological application. It all has to have more than just one fold uh, application. So I do try to do things on a bit more of a um, tiered aspect of uh, addressing it. Okay, so when the stranger uh, wants to pet your dog, the biggest issue a lot of times people say is, well, my skittish dog, and we'll say skittish, my skittish dog um, is all over the place and, and, and you know, it's afraid to meet people. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, uh, is that the, the, you know, the skittish dog is going to be all, all worried and all that stuff. And sometimes the skittish dog will either hide behind you or try to come up to the person and look at them. And if you can show your dog consistently that you're protecting them. Oh, shoot, I forgot something else. Sorry, I wrote stuff down here wrong. Um, but anyways, so if you can, if you can uh, teach your, your skittish dog that you're in control and that you're letting any stranger know how to approach your dog, this is what's really important. So what I always do when somebody says uh, to one of my dogs, once I've had them down trained uh, 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 enough to be socialized, um, and, and again, the, again, you know, it's taking the dog that's really reactive and dangerous, being able to down train them to the point where they let people pet them and, and you know, hang out with them and all that stuff. So that every single dog can be trained. That's why I said that. Um, so whenever somebody approaches, you can see it in people's faces, right? Especially right, for people who have dysfunctional or reactive dogs, you're like, oh, gosh, I can see that person's eyes. He, he wants to pet my dog. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And you're like, Arr. So what you do is when they do approach, and, they, and most times people will say, hey, is it okay if I pet your dog? So you can do one, one of a couple of things. One is you can say yes, and then I'll, we'll go about that approach. Or two, you can say, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm leash training my dog, and we're on. Uh, on a walk right now, on a leash training walk, I'm sorry, we can't stop. And then people go, oh, okay, that's cool. You're training your dog. Oh, okay. Because what happens if you say no, then they feel offended personally, and then you create animosity if it's in the same neighborhood. So you just go, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just leash training him today. And then you just keep walking. Same thing if you have your dog on muzzle. You just say, I'm muzzle training my dog today. And then people don't feel offended. And they don't think your dog is dangerous as much as they normally would by seeing a dog on muzzle. Um, so when the stranger approaches you, 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 and they say, Hey, can I pet your dog? You say, okay, but, um, there's a certain way to approach him. And what you do is you say, okay, just stop. And then your dog hears you talking to the other person, to the stranger, and you're giving them command to the stranger. So your dog, just like, remember I said about the dog coming up to attack your dog on leash and you have to protect your dog a few episodes ago. So you tell the stranger, stop. Don't do anything. And then what you do is you let your dog walk up almost to the end of the lead length. So again, six feet long. That's why you need to know the lead length. You let your dog walk up to the stranger up to six feet. And they might be a little bit skittish. But you can also tell that your dog is going to have some interest in saying hi to another human being. It's just natural natural for most dysfunctional dogs that they'll just at least want to check out the, 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 the potential uh, stranger danger and see whether or not that person is cool. And by you protecting, by you announcing to the human being, the stranger, hey, stop. Your dog's like, oh, cool. Dad's got it in control, right on. And then you, your dog starts to trust you, right? So your dog gets to the end of the rope. You just tell the person, this is what I need you to do, is to stop, squat down, and just put your hand out. And you see that the hand is an open palm. So we'll go into that a little bit later because I think I, yeah, I think I mentioned that here. Okay, so we'll go on that later on. And, and you just get them to approach you on that part. 
Because what you want to do is you want the dysfunctional dog or the abused dog to know that the stranger has an open hand. Because of course, the closed hand will remind a lot of dogs of being physically abused. Psychologically, they see that. It's not the aspect of treats or whatever. This way they see it's an open hand. And I've done this before. And, and I'll tell you, this is very hard to train a predatorial dog because they don't care if it's this or this. And I've had, them, I've had my whole hand inside. Uh, well, I didn't have it. This Dane had my hand inside his mouth. And it, it, it's a bit of a struggle to pull your hand out because they're not biting to hurt it because he would have broken it right through. He, he was warning me. Uh, because he thought I was going to hurt him, and you just have to stand there. Well, anyways, I won't go into that because I don't want people to do that. Um, okay, so again, keep the hand open. And what you want to do is I tell people to put their elbow on their knee, right? Because they're squatting down. So rest their elbow on their knee. So that means they're not moving it all over the place. It's steady. It's focused. And your dog is watching for movements. Your dog is watching for erratic behavior from the stranger. So if your hand's like this, then the if the stranger's hand is like this, then the dog's like, holy cow, this guy's kind of whatever. Because a lot of people who are squatting down can't can't keep their hand still. And so the sorry, and that's actually where I got bit by a dog. Um, and so when you put the elbow against your thigh, against your knee, it's locked in. And so that person, the stranger's hand is locked in. So they're not trying to chase the dog either, which is another thing that happens. And that's the, what is that other uh, part here? Um... People that walk with dogs. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so what ends up happening is then the stranger is not able to chase your dog with their hand because what happens if your dog comes up and your dog you'll see even if the, your dog your skittish dog comes this close and they turn away, they're waiting for this hand to move erratically. They don't know what the hand means, so they're waiting for the hand to move erratically. They're waiting for the other shoe to drop. So if the stranger is holding it there because you've told them what to do, your dog understands that you're protecting them and that you're controlling. The environment, the immediate environment. And if you're controlling the immediate environment, your dog can trust you. If you're telling the stranger that your dog and you have never met before, that you're controlling what's going on, your dog looks up to you like, oh, wow, you're taking care of me. That's why I say this alpha thing and the tying the dog to you, dumb, dumb, dumb. So what ends up happening there on top of that is your dog may not come up to the person. And this is what the thing here I kind of jumped over here is... Um, People that work with dogs, like trainers, behaviors, walk, uh, uh, career professional uh, dog people, and people that say dogs that love them, what ends up happening a lot of times because they have ego. You've got we've got to shut down our ego when it comes to dealing with other life, uh, other dogs. Because what ends up happening is if the dog comes up and doesn't want to be petted, or even sniff the hand, what do most people do that are professionals? Oh, and they start going after your dog. And of course, your dog is was expecting that to happen. So when you when when that stranger does that, the dog's like, I knew exactly you were trying to get me in his head. And that's why they get more skittish. And they're like, you know what? You couldn't control the environment. The other part why people do that, the, the trainers and behaviors start trying to pet your dog, is because they don't want to be proven that this one skittish dog doesn't like them. So it's our ego that happens. I used to do that too when I was, you know, starting out. It was like, oh yeah, let me go pet the dog. <laughs> and like, oh, and then you can see the behavior and the dog's like, no, 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 this is not cool. And then your dog starts, the dog starts looking at the owner like, oh my gosh, the, the, well, what is this guy doing? So again, this prevents people when you have the elbow on the knee, prevents people from trying to chase your dog. Because again, they're going to try to save their ego like, oh wait, this dog loves me. And how many times have you run into people who are your friends? Who are like, oh, dogs love me, and then, and then, and <laughs> I've heard this too. They're like, oh, you know, uh, my neighbor uh, said his, his, you know, my 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 neighbor said that everybody loves his, uh, loves him, and all the dogs love him except my dog, and he doesn't know why. Well, it's because he's that guy. And I said, well, I guess he tries to chase him with his hand. And they go, yeah, he he has tried to be nice to him. Don't let him have some time. And that's where the confusion of tying the dog to you and walking around saying nothing. And, and when I talk about bringing a, an adopted dog, a sheltered dog into your home, interact with them. Don't leave them alone. Don't fire them off into some corner and let them start to introvert even more in. Interact with them. But interact with them reciprocally based on their behaviors and within reason. Okay, so 
Um, let me just see. All right, so the other reason why we want to keep the lead at six feet at all times, I just want to get through this because uh, I think we're like at 40 minutes now. So we don't want the, you spaghettiing it all the time, right? We don't want people, and people do that. You'll see that, uh, you know, especially people with reactive dogs, you can tell. Right off the bat, when you walk down the street, you see somebody holding the leash like this and two hands and then it's wrapped up like that. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, this person has a dog that might be an issue. And that's the same kind of person who's like, I don't know what to do. So again, following that through, etc. The reason why we want to keep the lead at six feet long, that's why we want to keep a six foot standard lead as well. Because if your dog gets onto a lead with somebody else, they know their six feet at all times is already there. So your dog's like, Oh, I'm ready there. It's like putting on a nice pair of shoes. It's like eating comfort food under stress. The other reason why you always want to have your dog at six feet, then you teach them consistency of the leash length. The length of the leash your dog knows is a certain length, which is always six feet. Not that your dog understands measurements as per se, but your dog understands, oh, wait, okay, I always have six feet. And that's why you also see some dogs that are on leash start getting skittish and start going all over the place. Because most times, the people who are handling their dog have been doing this, so your dog has no idea what the leash length is. Your dog does not know his perimeter of escape. He doesn't know he has six feet to go around you if he's getting chased. And I have had my guys where they have become quite passive and receptive to other people and so far like that, formerly being quite dangerous and predatorial, where they've been approached by other dogs and they've like I said, they see, look to me to protect them and they'll go back to the six foot of the length, lead length and they won't pull on it. They just go back to the six foot lead length and they just wait there because they know they have six feet. They're not struggling. They know that's where they're going to be safe because they always have six feet and I'm protecting them in the front by stepping in front of the other dog, etc., etc. All right. So um, the other reason why you want to keep six feet at all times instead of spaghettiing it all up and everything and, and curling around your hand and all that stuff is it's like cruise control for your dog. If you're driving, right, another passenger thing, excuse me, if you're driving, uh, if you're in a car with somebody and they're driving and, um, excuse me, and, um, you know, uh, the speed limit is uh, 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour, right? So the speed limit is, uh, I'm going to use uh, kilometers here, the speed limit is 80 kilometers an hour. Uh, and again, I'm using kilometers because it's uh, metric is quite, you know, anyways. So uh, 80 kilometers an hour and the driver is doing 45 kilometers, and then 75 kilometers, and then 95 kilometers, and then 30, and then 80, and then you're like, dude, could you just do the, the 80 speed limit, please? Could you just put it on cruise control instead? I, I'd rather go on cruise control than you going back and forth in speed. And you're just like, just keep one speed. Leash control. Six foot lead. It makes sense. That's why the dog can't dominate you if they trust you. That's why your dog learns to trust you if you give him consistency. But if you spaghetti it all up, you screw it all up. Your dog can't trust you anymore. Um, okay, uh, let's just see. Yeah, so consistency teaches leash perimeter, right? It's, again, the leash, what I call territorial control, just like property, just like uh, location, territorial control. So we want to keep the leash up that way. Uh, and remember, if you have any questions, start getting them ready if you want to, and then you can uh, comment them after uh, I'm done here. Okay. Um, so when you're walking with your dog, don't cut corners. In the beginning, when you're teaching your new dog to trust you, don't cut corners. A, B, C. Don't go A to C. A, then to B. Make an actual turn, then to C. So if you're going around the block, don't cut across, don't cut across on the grass. Go to the end of the sidewalk corner and then turn right. A, B, C. Not A to C, no. A, B, C. Because what that teaches your dog is that you're making decisive movements. How many times have you gone shopping with somebody? And again, I'm going to use a human analogy. You know, if you're going shopping with your girlfriend or, or wife and she says, I'm going to the mall. Let's go to the mall. I want to buy a pair of shoes at this location, etc., etc." Let's do that. Okay. Is that cool? We're just going to go to the mall and that's it. We're going to go to, to the shoe store and that's it. And she's got your hand and you're walking along. You're like, okay, cool. Go into the shoe store and then I get to go home and watch some football, right? So you're walking and walking and they, you see the shoe store there. And then as you're about to get there, your, your, your wife goes, oh no, let's go over here. And, he, and she yanked your arm over the other way. You're like, I thought we were going to the shoe store. Why are we going over here? 
this is what I thought we were doing. Uh, are we not going to go to B? Why are we going to C all of a sudden? We want to keep consistency so your dog can trust every movement that you do. And that goes back to yesterday or the other day when it was, um, if another dog comes up, what should I do? And you got no way to avoid it. Remember, I think I said it to, um, uh, I, I can't remember who I said it to, but I said, if that happens, you have no choice. Then you just literally make a sharp 90 degree cut corner, a decisive movement, and then you go 90 back if you have to cross the street. You don't avoid, etc., etc. Anyways, we won't do that. You go go watch the, sh uh, the the other episodes on that end. So again, when you do A, B, C, you teach your dog consistency. The other aspect of that too is um, where did I see about wildlife corridor? Um, wildlife corridor. Okay. Uh, hi, William. All right. Okay. So cruise control. Don't let your dog pull you from the wildlife corridor. So wildlife corridor is is the trail, right? In the wild, you see the trail. The do uh, animals have always walking through deer and so forth, and you see the trail being cut into the into the grass all the time. Wildlife corridor. Your dog knows. No, William. He's about to knock this over. Um, your dog knows the sidewalk. He can see the color contrast, whether or not the dog is doing field of vision, perception, and, and assimilation, as, and, and analyzing, and so forth like that. Your dog can see the difference between the cement, the dirt, and the grass. So when you cut corners, you start changing the territory, you start changing the terrain, you, you start changing the feeling of the substrate. Then the dog's like, okay, this is kind of different, and then your dog's in a different aspect. Because now, say for example, you go from cement onto the grass, back to the cement. Your dog's got to make an adjustment for the grass to make sure that he's not, you know, hitting any potholes or whatever. These little things, right? So that if your dog is not thinking and your dog's not overstimulated or, or um, uh, you know, having extra things having to worry about, then you just keep the consistency, blah, blah, blah. Your dog knows when you stray off the wildlife quarter, there must be a reason why. If your dog pulls you, then you're feeding to your dog's anxiety, etc., etc. Anyways, because um, uh, I don't want to, uh, we talk about that. Okay, uh, and so the other thing I talk about is um, when and why your skittish dog needs you to trust the stranger. So that goes back to the same part of telling your dog that you have things in control, that he can trust you by telling the stranger to follow your instructions. And if the stranger can't follow your instructions, you immediately just depart. You say, oh, you know, actually I don't have time. Oh, you know, I, I'm, I didn't realize the time, I got to go. And then that way your dog doesn't get exposed to somebody who's going to be like this with them. Uh, ah. And you're like, oh gosh. you got to let your dog know that you're in control of their exposure to strangers so that it's consistent, that they look to you, that we ourselves as a parent, our dog's parent, is taking care of them. Codependency. Not alpha. Not pack mentality. Codependency. So again, I say it is a three-time rule, which is great. I, I actually learned this uh, phrasing because I told somebody I didn't know how to exactly say it in a way. And they said, oh, it's like stop, drop, and reset. So again, tell the stranger or yourself, you stop, you squat down, you drop, and then you reset, which is the techniques that I told some of the, uh, I've taught my clients where you we go down and we calm our dog down by either giving them a hug or touching certain parts of their body or speaking to them in a certain way or all combination of three. So stop, drop, and reset. Same thing with a human being, stranger. Stop, squat down, right? Stop, drop, and put your hand out. Then your dog knows every time someone meets them, it's consistent. And when they learn the consistency of that same standard template of approach from the stranger through your orders, then your dog starts to have more casualness in allowing varia uh, variables, variation to that template. Then your dog starts to reason, well, if they did it this way, it's okay if they kind of do it this way now. Reasoning, teaching your dog to be smarter. And it works. Like I said last night, the predatorial dog is brilliant. The predatorial dog is extremely smart. It's just gorgeous how intelligent these guys are. Uh, you know, unfortunately subject to severe abuse. Um, so how the strangers should pet your dog, we did that. The more often you control strangers, the more your dog trusts you. It's the same thing, like, you wouldn't let your kid be introduced to your neighbor who just moved in and their child is wild off the wall and screaming and yelling and right. You can be like, ah, I don't want, I don't, I don't want my, my kid to be with that kid. Same thing for your dog. 
if you can be consistent with the people that you're exposing. And there's nothing wrong if you see somebody, like I've, you know, no offense or anything like that. I mean, I used to smoke cigarettes when I was younger, but when I see somebody smoking a cigarette and they go, oh, can I pet your dog? The first thing off my head, <laughs> in my mind is, I don't want you petting, I, I don't want you touching my dog. Because when they smoke, then the smell of the cigarette oil, right, gets onto the dog's fur and then you're like, oh, that's gross. And I wonder if the guy was, you know, like, whatever right so we don't want the smell and so i always say to them, no i'm sorry or if there's somebody somewhat skittish themselves a little bit um you know maybe a drug addict right because we do run into them and we can't we can't avoid it we'll go downtown uh, different areas you might run into somebody who is erratic behavior and they want oh i want to pet your dog and what do we always say we're like no way if i if i let you pet my dog i might have to wash him uh you know to, to get whatever might be on there um and so there's nothing wrong so again I'm sorry I'm on my way, I, uh, I've got to go now that I don't have enough time, I'm leash training my dog, etc. Uh, with your skittish dog, uh, dogs need to be reset, right? Skittish dog needs to be reset. Um, that's, I think we're going to, you know, a little bit all the, okay. We'll, we'll, we won't do that, but we'll, we'll talk about um, touching your dysfunctional dog during walks as well. So that helps with the skittish dog, that helps with a reactive dog. As you're walking with your dog at the end of the leash, and as they sometimes casually slow down or meander, or if you're just able to walk close to them while they're still walking at the same pace so that they don't know you're catching up, just reach down and touch your dog's back end. A lot of times people with reactive or skittish dogs, when they go touch their own dog's back end, their dog will, just like I said about uh, Walter, they'll flip around right away and go, what the heck? Talk, same thing about dogs being humped as well. That, right, okay, like yesterday, we talked about that, I talked about that, so the same thing. So again, keep practicing touching your dog's back. And, and there's, there's other techniques to do so, which I, I teach my, um, my, my clients how to do, uh, how to really fully integrate that, touching them at the back, and how to do it, and how to properly address it, based on their dog's particular dysfunction or dysfunctions. And um, always communicate with your dog, always speak your dog's name, always say your dog's name with conversation. Say it like it means something, like you really are saying their name, as if you're saying a human being's name. Keep that same context, that same level, so that you have that connection. Uh, okay, so here's the other thing too, is if you ever uh, drag line for hard to recall dogs, uh, I wanna talk about that part, because it kinda goes in with the leash aspect of it. When you take your dog to an off-leash park, a small off-leash park, or one that is fully enclosed, if it's huge, as long as it's fully enclosed, and if your dog is not good at recall, but they don't, you know, and they think most times if your dog knows you, that your skittish dog knows you, your dysfunctional dog knows you, they're not going to run away from you. They're just going to keep like 10 feet, 15 feet away from you. Attach a drag line to them. So you can do a 20 foot drag line, a 30 foot drag line. You can do whatever length of drag line that you want. Just attach it to your dog, right? You don't get a clip on and, and you put it on and then you let your dog drag it wherever the place. Now, the big problem with that is... Uh, you, you know, then the drag line goes through mud, feces, uh, stuff like that, especially in this winter weather coming up. So what you can do, and economically speaking, just go to your hardware store, go to your dollar store, and you just buy regular rope that you don't care if it gets ripped up. Make sure it's strength, tensile strength, right? Make sure it's rated for the weight of your dog if you have to, and you just let that on 20, 30 feet. If it's a dollar store uh, piece of rope, it doesn't matter. It costs you a dollar. You just throw it away. So you keep that drag line on, and then your dog can be stopped whenever it needs to be. And when you do go after your dog that's on the drag line, when you want to do recall, you want to just stand on it, and then when the dog gets to the end of it, right, because boom, right, they're gonna feel that, and then you go. You just have to acknowledge them, and then you just slowly walk yourself back into the lead line, uh, back down to them, and that's it. And then when you get to where they are, you give them a hug. You reset with them. You give them some affection so that your dog does understand that, oh, this is not too bad. I was kind of panicked, but now I got affection. Codependency. There we go again. I mean, it's it's further deeper than that on a psychological level, on a psychogenetic level. But uh, I, like I said, is I've had people uh, message me and say, you know, uh, uh, could you make it more human sounding so that I can understand what's going on? Uh, the other part of it um, is the, the big controversy in regards to retractable leashes. Everybody that I've seen, I've seen this the other day to someone saying, you know, um, I hate retractable leashes. They're horrible, they're horrible, they're horrible, and it's the worst device in the world, and they break all the time, etc. 
I had somebody, uh, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago, when I was talking about retractable leashes. And they were you know, a great trainer. And they said retractable leashes are, are, are horrible and they break all the time. And I've had, uh, I have re brand new retractable leashes and I've used them on, on the dogs that I'm training and they've broken and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, is that because you let the leash, the lead line on the retractable leash run right out so that it breaks? And like, no, the thing's defective, right? The reply, I'm like, you do know that at the end of that leash that's connected at the, at the retractable that's connected to the spool, the, right, the spring-loaded spool, it's only a little piece of metal that's holding on to it. So you're expecting, for example, a 100-pound dog that's running at full speed on 20 feet of line, and you're just, letting the, you're just holding the retractable, and you're not breaking to stop, it, stop the lead from being yanked right out? Could you imagine if you held a rope like that and the dog's running through it and you're trying to hold it at the very end? The, the thing goes right through your fingers. It breaks right through. And then they didn't comment anymore. Because I just showed them that their ignorance of physics is wrong. And then they're going to go on to continue saying, well, retractables are bad. Because, of course, the ego. I know everything. I'm the greatest trainer. I'm the accredited trainer, blah, 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 like that. And that's what harms dogs, right? So that's why I'm kind of doing all this stuff, right? So, again, if you're using a retractable lead, practice it. Know your length of full extension. And then spool it back two or three turns so that way you have your tension on it, right? The physics, right? The friction, the physics, right? So you have your tension on it, and that way the lead is not pulling all the way out and the easiest way to do is once you know where you have you know it's fully out and you just spool it in two or three times then take a a, a, a a white marker or something whatever the color is a contrasting color and then you just mark it there so that way when you visually see it all the way out you go okay i gotta stop it now before it <laughs> leads out and then i you know then it's a hundred dollar uh lead that gets destroyed or a retractable that gets destroyed uh, the retractable leash on my end, I've always used it with every single dog I've, I've worked with, every single dog that I've rehabilitated from, uh, from Walter to Minky and all the dogs in between. Always use a retractable lead because I've been practicing, practicing. It allows my dogs to trust me. It allows my dogs to know that I have care and control of what's going on. It allows me to do recall. It allows a whole bunch of things for that part of it. And as long as you're paying attention, as long as you're practicing and practicing with proficiency on the lead line, retractable leashes are excellent tools. It's the fact that people don't know how to use it and then they hear other people saying it's bad, like that, that trainer, and then it goes to the point where it's just like, it's garbage. No, it's not garbage because you just don't know how to use it. I've got... I've got a, a, a retractable um, that actually my friends, uh, uh, Debbie and Mike, are fixing um, that has a 150-pound uh, uh, um, uh, rating on it. And I've used that for, well, it's just, it finally broke now um, a few months ago. Uh, but uh, was, I think I've used it for almost over over five years now. I've used it for over five years now on all sizes of dogs significant dogs when they're going and they're and these are the same one like i said they're running right at the end of it and i'm holding on to them and they're just yanking my whole arm through but the retractable is not breaking and then i recall i bring them back in etc etc so yeah it's just practice 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 and always practice with that doesn't matter if your dog's off smelling something just practice with it just just practice with the, the retractable just practice with it and just keep bringing it back in and forth and so forth like that right that's that's all um Okay, and so um, it also allows uh, you to have the constant interaction when you need to correct them, when you need to do recall. You know, you just basically say, George, come here, and then you just pull the lead back, and that's it. Same thing like we talked about passive training, et cetera, et cetera, and also the other topic of in-motion training, which I'll uh, get to at another time as well. Um, and then I was going to... Yeah, we don't have time here. I was going to talk about some other things, which was, uh, you know, why dogs smell your face and other dogs' faces when they when you come home or when they meet a new dog or they see each other, they, you know, one dog comes home and sees the other dog and then start smelling each other's faces and they look, they smell left and right, all that stuff. I'll have to get to that at another time. Uh, sorry, I didn't have any time to um, uh, talk about the, the dogs taking socks and all that. So maybe we'll do that on another time. I want to say one thing I, I saw. I don't know if anybody's ever seen um, uh, the YouTube channel Answers with Joe. 
Uh, the guy's name is Joe Scott. It's pretty cool because he talks about like you know physics and, and a whole bunch of stuff, right? It's always good to kind of keep our minds expanded, even on things we don't know about. And he talks about some you know stuff that is kind of just silly stuff on purpose because it's just you know curiosity sake. But he actually had this episode about uh, dogs. Would humans have survived without dogs? And uh, and it goes back. It was funny because I wasn't even thinking about it. And I was thought last night I was like, oh yeah. And he has a part in it about would dogs have survived without human beings or human beings survived without dogs, etc. The cohabitation aspect, which unfortunately Joe's got it wrong. And I know he's got like 550,000 followers. Um, on the science, he's smart, but and admits when he doesn't know what he's talking about. But when it comes to this dog part, he's saying, you know, uh, about the dogs pointing. Remember I said that yesterday? It's not the fact that we, the dogs instinctively know when we're pointing. The dogs have learned it. And then they have this trainer, um, McCann Dog Training. They're, they're quite a well-known dog training group. And I and they had a little bit of a, a segment about what she was talking about, you know, that you can train dogs and that dogs instinctively, and this is what Joel said, and then he got the McCann, one of the trainers, this, uh, a larger woman, to talk about, uh, I guess she's one of the head trainers, like how dogs instinctively know which way you can turn your head and like the dog's behind her and the dog comes running and then she turns her head and the dog turns to the left and the dog, she turns her head to the right and the dog turns to the right and he goes, dogs instinctively know and she says it herself. I'm like, oh my gosh, another foolish uh, statement. She goes and says, uh, you know, dogs instinctively know which way to go just by watching you. And it's like, no, they don't, dummy. <laughs> Your dog, those dogs have learned through treat training because you can see by the dog's behavior and how they're paying attention to her, her her torso downward and then that they've learned to migrate up to the head from that subconscious, the micro training, the, the subconscious training of pointing all the time and that the dog has learned that and then they're like, no, the dogs instinctively know which way we're pointing and what, uh, right? You know what I mean? It's like, like I said, it's like, uh, it's like reading and listening and watching a kid's cartoon show about why the sky is blue. So this McCann dog trainer is totally wrong about it. And they and I'm just like, these are the people that are leading the rest of our dog industry down the rabbit hole of incorrect understanding and they just stay entrenched. Like Erica Eden from Eden Dog Training Academy, they just stuck in their little thing and then if they have something that might make sense, they go, no, 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 there's no way. And, and like I said, with Erica, actually, we have a PM. I have a PM with her about it. And and she was talking about behavioral euthanasia as well. Uh, I might talk about that some other time when I learn how to do some screen sharing so I can show it to you. <laughs> she talks about having to kill. Well, she says euthanize one dog for behavior and all that stuff. And so I wrote back. Um, These are the issues why and it's most likely what kind of dog this was and da, 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 da. And. Before we were always going back and forth, kind of like, you know, professional discussion. And she didn't respond after that. Just total chickened out because I totally brought her to task. And I said, this is what your that dog's behavior was like. And that's why it happened. This is probably what kind of family they have. And this is the kind of behavior your dog, that dog was probably exhibiting. No response after that. And that's when we know we got somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. So these dog trainers, etc. Just destroying dogs lives by the arrogance by the conceit and I mean you know uh, Learberg like I said uh, trolled me as well and I mean these guys are got their you know dog training universities and all stuff and their courses are like 40 50 100 300 500 1200 dollars online courses which is passive income that leash the leash training that I just gave you all practice it come back and please comment Please do me a favor and comment about it so people can see that it will work. People who have trained with me, please, you'll see it has all worked. And that just saved you uh, several hundred dollars for no, and you'll have a dog that pays attention to you more. Um, okay, so I'm going to let you go because I'm going to go on to uh, Peace Love Danes uh, to go respond back to uh, um, Aaron's uh, post and hopefully she'll be online. And then if you have any questions, any ideas for the next topic, let me know. Um, you know, we can always talk about dogs, how they process pain or how dogs uh, track prey. That's a little bit more higher evolved in the uh, psycholo uh, psychological aspects of dogs. We can talk about any topic that you want to. Uh, if you want to talk about something, again, that's really quite deep that you always had a question about, I guarantee you I have the answer to it because I've associated with dogs that have all done that through. Um, you know, like even the pain redundancy, uh, the pain, how dogs process pain, the scientists 
the, the white papers on it, well, we're not really sure. We don't think that dogs really register pain the same way. Oh my gosh, how dumb. If Walter can feel me touch his back end like that, and he can flip around and because I touched him like that, just barely touched him and go back and get my hand. That's not pain, is it? That's sensitivity. That's the dog's ability to process even the most minor touches. Have you ever gone to the point where you just blew on your dog's fur and, the, and they shiver? So this pain redundancy that's going on, these, the, the, that, again, that's why I say uh, Temple Grand and Ian Dunbar, uh, Erica Eden, um, McCann Dog Trainers, Learberg, they got no idea what they're talking about because they're so high up on the food chain, they just gave up, they capitulated, they got lazy. It's sad, it's a disservice to dogs. I'm always actively learning from dogs. I'm always learning because I've, I'm too old to be a jerk off to the dog's lives. It's just it's six million dogs are being killed. And a lot of these trainers and behaviors are the ones behind those dogs' deaths. And if anybody knows Lori Wingard, 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 with two dogs, one Dane is um, Tsunami. Uh, ask her if Tsunami's still alive, because um, uh, I did a console, and I even phoned her, and I talked to her for over an hour on the phone. And, um, you know, I asked her to follow me on Facebook and subscribe to me, and even she didn't do it. And I said, hey, would you mind just doing that? Because I, 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 you know, I could have charged you $140 for that session, but I didn't. I did it for free, because she was part of a group. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then the next day, she starts, you know, oh, I need help with Tsunami. And then I help her again. I said, could you just join the group? And then the next day, she's like, I'm killing Tsunami. And I'm like, just surrender her to rescue. And then she blocked us. And she blocked the, the rescue group that I uh, put her into group PM as well. So if you know her, uh, could you please let me know if Tsunami is still alive? Because um, it's her fault. And I even said to her, it's the, the environment that your dog is in. And she would thrive better in another environment. So again, all these things, right? My, my life is committed to dogs. And, you know, when I have people that are in, who are despondent or in despair, I'm going to go out and reach out and help them. And I'll do it for free often because it's my obligation to save the dog's life. And, uh, you know, um, it just sucks when people take advantage of... Uh, it just sucks. But I'm, I'm going to keep helping. Anyways. So, uh, okay, so out of that that just <laughs> point there, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just because I'm only concerned about Tsunami. I'm only concerned about the dog. It doesn't matter if it's a Great Dane or if it's a Boston Terrier or... Or any dog uh, in the in the breed range, um, anyhow. So, if you have any questions, any comments, let me know what the leash work happens. I've had somebody, a couple people already, who said that they tried the dog barking at the window thing and telling their dog not to yell. Like I showed real time in life when Lincoln's out barking at there, and I just telling him to stop. Same thing with Minky with the resource guarding with the two Danes behind around him, just talking to him because they trust what I'm saying. The conversation that we're having. All right, let me know. Anything changes? I got some sessions this coming week. Uh, maybe I'll talk to you about that. And uh, if you have any ideas, let me know as well. Comments. Please subscribe to my channel, YouTube. Links are in my description. Please follow me on Twitter. Uh, please help support my work, my pro bono work, uh, getting the stuff out. Everything that I talk about makes sense. There's no refutation. Refutation. Uh, refutation. Refutation. There, there, there's no denying everything that I've said works 100% of the time. There's nobody out here that can can refute what I said or any of the teaching that I've done, and it's all for free. And uh, again, you know, I've got um, I've got a dog that a, um, a well-known rescue organization in the United States uh, sent to me, uh, um, you know, and they have a huge resource uh, pool of uh, of trainers and behaviors that they could deal with because they're well-known and they have a strong association with some well-known uh, entertainment people and um, you know they sent them to me uh, for rehab and I did it for free as well so I'm just waiting for them to fall through on their end of the of uh, their of our agreement which was anyways I won't get to that but um, it's a reason why people come to me out of all the people in North America not because 
I'm trying to make money off of the the aspects of dogs, and uh, it's because I'm out there to save dogs and uh, to teach human beings to be better parents, to have conversations with their dogs, and to really do amazing things and make your dog smarter, make your dog learn to think, make your dog know how to reason. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Bye-bye.